I mentioned, some of you may or may not remember it, two, three weeks ago, whenever it was. Yeah, after Ken's class one night on Romans, he had been talking about emphasizing the wrath of God that is against all those who die rebellious to the Lord in their sins. And I was thinking at that time and mentioned it after class that there's a lesson I wanted to deal with that in because or deal with that idea. But it's really the opposite. We often hear in the scripture such things. It is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Or it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Or our God is a consuming fire. And all the other passages that warn men against living a life of rebellion to God. This life is meant for us to find God and His Savior and the gospel and to live it out proving to God we love Him with all that we are and have and that we have great faith in Him, His Son, and the gospel system because the gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. He may have could have saved us any way he chose, but he located saving power in the gospel of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And I want to be speaking primarily with my brethren this morning as to one of the things we enjoy as we're faithful to Christ. And it really is around the idea of what Paul said in Romans 8, 24, for we are saved by hope. Remembering that hope there means the expectation of the faithful child of God of heaven and all that that means. I will hasten to say, as I have many times, that as much as the Bible has to say about heaven, the eternal abode of the blessed, where we never will leave it, and we're glorified even as his son is glorified, that when I think about that, I realize that's designed to encourage us through this time of testing and trying in this life. Will we be faithful to Christ and do only as he's authorized in his word? Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Will we do that? Are we willing when we make a misstep to have hearts easily pricked by the word of God and our conscience is caused to turn and say, Father, forgive me. That attitude always prevailing in the mind of a Christian as we walk the straight and narrow way of truth. But there is a good thing that we ought to have in our mind. Because the wrath of God is reserved for those who die unfaithful to him or who never will obey the gospel and don't care to. It was never meant to be something that should be upon the mind of the faithful child of God. Oh, we should know uh, those things because they encourage us to stay with the truth. That's right. But for the person who's living the truth out in their life, doing only as the Lord authorizes, then we should not be under the horror and fearfulness that comes to those who never think of God and who do all they can to not think of the judgment and to not think of the eternal abode of the wicked, the Gehenna hell, where the fires are not quenched, where the worm dieth not, that lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death from which no man returns, and there is no hope. No, we should be thinking about the reward for the faithful. And that within itself, as I said, is encouragement. So I want to talk to you today, basically it centers on one word, and I'll get to where it's found in just a moment. But it actually is boldness. Boldness in the day of judgment. That's not for the person outside of Christ or who has fallen from grace and is unfaithful to the Lord. That's for the faithful child of God. 
In 1 John 4 and verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That we may have boldness when? In the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. Which simply means we're abiding in the truth. That's what it means to be faithful. That's what it means, as Paul said, for us to walk by faith and not by sight, seeing that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 and Romans 10, 17. So please notice that word boldness. It does not mean with arrogance and puffed up pride that the Bible condemns. The word actually carries with it the Greek word, and there are several words in the New Testament that are translated boldness or bold. But herein, this word carries with it the idea of not feeling burdened or fearful, but feeling confidence. Do you ever think that you as a faithful child of God can be confident as you stand before the judgment seat of Christ where we give account of the deeds done in the body. That's what John's saying. Here's one of those blessings that belongs only to the church and to the faithful of Christ. What does it mean? Well, I admit it sounds like a grand thing. That's the reason I'm talking about it, and it is. That in the judgment we need not stand before Christ in awful, trembling fear. But rather we can stand before him in boldness, in confidence. You see, this goes back to us believing the promises Christ has made to us. Remember when he said to the apostles that he was going away to prepare a place for them. But he would come back and receive them unto himself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John had things to say about that in several places. First John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Us who? Well, the apostles and Christians. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Why is that the case? We follow the truth of Christ. And the world doesn't have any idea about what that's like. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Why do we have such words of comfort? And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. That's why. So when you think about what lies ahead for the faithful child of God, and you consider what all the scriptures do say about that day of judgment, and you remember the Lord said himself, Come, you blessed of my Father, and hear it the kingdom prepared for you before the world was. He continues on there. So it's always been in the mind of God Almighty to save those who love His Son and keep His commandments. As Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And throughout the book of 1 John, he makes that clear, that those who really love him are doing what God said. That God manifested his love toward man and the sending of his son. Look at verse 9 of chapter 4. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might ha- live through him. Well, if you're a member of the Lord's church and the way the Bible defines that in membership, then you have that. 
We need to examine this because this love produced what is called the everlasting atonement, if you want to word it in that way. Verse 10 says, Herein we love not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, Christ living a perfect life, a sinless life, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, could be the Lamb of God and go to the cross and die not for sins he did, for he had none. But because he had none, he could die. And we through faith, obedient faith in him, could enjoy what he intends for men to have. There would be no point in Christ's death except that it pertains to us. His spiritual family, the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom of heaven. Because he purchased the church with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. And we who become members of that church benefit from that blood when we in a humble heart are brought to belief in Christ as the Son of God and all the Bible teaches about what that means. And we're brought to repentance, confession of faith, and baptism into Christ for the remission of our sins. It is only then the Lord adds us to that church, that blood-bought body. And it's only in baptism that we contact the saving blood of Jesus Christ because we're baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And it's in his death that he shed his blood. Well, it's obvious we can't go back to the cross, literally stand beneath the cross and have the blood of Christ grip upon us, then go with him into the tomb, and on that first day of the week following, come out of the tomb with his resurre at his resurrection. But we can't obey a form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, and 18. And what is that form? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's only then that our sins are remitted not at belief, not at repentance, not at confession of faith. Those are all headed toward the right direction and the necessary. But you're only baptized into Christ. You don't believe into Christ. You don't repent into Christ. And you don't confess your faith in Christ into Christ. But you are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3 verse 27 and Acts 2 verse 38. That's why the Lord adds you to the church. You know, he knows our hearts. He knows the sincerity or the lack thereof and the purpose and motive of our hearts when we obey the gospel. So he and he alone adds us because he knows to his church where we're covered by the blood as John dealt with in 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So this love produced the everlasting atonement and propitiation for our sins, according to verse 10 of chapter 4, 1 John. And that as we have received this love from God, it is our obligation as Christians, those who are of Christ, members of his spiritual family, 1 John, or rather 1 Timothy 3.15. We are to manifest it toward him and toward others. Look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. This love, I remind you again, is not just an emotional, touchy-feely thing. It is a love that ultimately is. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, even as John uses it, the agape love that wills the highest good to my brethren. It wants them to walk in the light as he is in the light. It does everything possible to help my brethren live according to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And we even have teaching in Galatians that tells us that if a brother is overtaken in a trespass or a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Thus we have obligations. This love brings upon us obligations to one another, whether we're faithful and there he addresses even if we sin. We have an obligation, a responsibility, dis discharge our duty one to another in the fellowship that goes along 
with members of the church. I can think of nothing greater as far as my willing anything than I will that all members of the Lord's church be faithful and that I do all I can to help them to be faithful. Even when I know some won't be, I still do what I can to help them to be faithful. Now, that should be upon everybody's minds. That's a member of the Lord's church and all that that means. Now, John continues by pointing out that God is to dwell in us. And in us is his love perfected. You'll notice, though, his love is perfected as we do what he tells, tells us to do, as we obey his commandments. You cannot perfect the love of God in you and think about yourself or other members of the church or even those out in the world that need the gospel except that you abide in the doctrine of Christ, that it guides your thoughts and your words and your actions. The idea of love perfected then is that love is completed. It's brought to maturity. It's reaching its ultimate and that's what we labor to do as members of the church. That's what it means to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We sing that song sometimes, walking in his footsteps. So by God dwelling in us, it means we follow his word. I can't conceive of God dwelling in us, and yet you don't do what he says. That's kind of contradictory to me. Oh, yeah, I have God in me. Well, then why are you not following these teachings of Christ? Well, I have God dwelling in me. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. That's like the Jews back in their day of rebellion against God and not keeping the law of Moses. What they would say was, well, the temple of God, the temple of God. In other words, there's the temple. He dwells among us. They didn't realize that meant nothing if they didn't keep the commandments. So every prophet that was sent to rebuke Israel and Judah for their sins pointed out that all that means nothing if you don't love him and do what he tells you. Even old King Saul had to hear from the prophet that it's better to obey than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. He said, I thought sacrifice was involved in doing the law. It is, but it's worth nothing if you don't do it all. If you don't have an attitude of let me be obedient to everything God said. Well, today we're not under the law of Moses. Well, what are we under? The authority of Jesus Christ. Christ said that all authority had been given unto him in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Well, where do you find out what he's authorized? By studying his last will and testament. If you have a mother or father or uncle or aunt or somebody that is deceased and they have a will, unless you're authorizing that will, and you're specified, you don't get anything of what they left behind, great or small. Thus, if I want to know the will of the Lord today, I don't expect him to speak from heaven directly to me and tell me. I have his word. I have it already written. It's been here nearly 2,000 years. I can know exactly by reading it what he said. So whoso continueth in the perfect law of liberty, if we walk therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So God loves us and desires to dwell in us, but that can't be if I have a view toward his word that I'm not going to do it, but I'll only maybe do what suits me. He then permits man coming from his faith in God and his gospel system to respond obediently to his love. When you preach the gospel to people who are not Christians, explaining to them the love of God, the love of Christ, what Christ did in the terms of pardon Christ set out so men could be saved because the gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Then you're explaining how God extends his love to mankind so man can benefit from it. What good would God's love be if we couldn't benefit from it? make any sense I could talk about God being love all day long but if I don't know what that means when it comes to me then what good is it well I know that God's love for me gave me the scriptures 
We forget that's one of the greatest proofs of God's love for us, not just in the giving of his son, but that he gave the scriptures to us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. And there again, it means complete spiritually, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we're to manifest every good and godly trait toward other men that that word teaches a good and godly trait. That's what it means to be faithful. So in this, the apostle John tells us that this love is perfected in us or brought to maturity. It's the child of God living right with God and right with man. That's what it means to be a righteous person. It's to be right with God and right with man. Now, all of that is designed to get us more even to our point, which we will emphasize a few things we've already mentioned. So based upon these considerations, John states that when one approaches the judgment of God, since most people are lost, it is abject fear that possesses him. I don't know whether you give much thought about those things, but everyone on this earth who's ever lived will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things done in the body. It may not be politically correct to cause you to think about that, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in my duty as a Christian and as a preacher of the gospel and in preaching the whole counsel of God to cause us to think about these things. When I study my own Bible for my own uh, well, wellness spiritually, I should be thinking about these things. And so the man who's not obeyed the gospel is the one who should fear. I don't mind telling you when, that uh, my love for you and the love of God for you and the love of Christ for you is to cause you to realize that you should be filled with fear at the prospect of standing before Christ in the judgment seat when you haven't lived like the Bible says. And you see, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, because of wicked people who persecuted them for their faith, he said, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels taking vengeance on them and flaming fire taking vengeance on them because they haven't believed in God or obeyed the gospel of Christ. Well, that's a horrible thing. Why did he write that to Christians? Because that should comfort the Christian. You see, the coming of Christ brings about complete and final justice. There's no real justice in this life, not as we would like to see it. No complete justice. <clears throat> but God who knows all things. And he said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, is a God of justice. So for the child of God who's been abused for his faith, you need to know God takes note of that. If he who knows the very number of the hairs on your head and knows even when the sparrow falls, as he said, are you not worth much more than many sparrows? Then he knows just exactly how to punish those who persecute the church because it loves the Lord and keeps his commandments. <coughs> now, to those who live a life of sin, as I said in the beginning, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, 31. I think that passage can be read over without really letting it sink in. We don't know what fear is, and all of us experience fear sometimes. But we don't know what fear is to come before Jesus Christ's judgment seat. <clears throat> When you know he knows all things, 
There's no hiding anything from him. You'll notice in every judgment account in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus gave. There's no room for argument. All that there is there is sentences being passed on the basis of how you lived your life. Well, now remember, John said that we should have boldness when faithful Christians come before the judgment seat of Christ. So when the wicked is brought before the judgment seat of our Lord, it will be a thing of abject terror indeed because there's going to be a pronouncement on them that will never end. I can't conceive of heaven never ending because of my mind so oriented to finite things. It begins with use, it's worn out, and it ends. <coughs> But I'm told in the good word of God that heaven doesn't end. I'm told in ways I can grasp some things about the glory God has for the faithful. But I can't really fathom it. On the other hand, he does the same thing for those who determine not to follow him, who determine to rebel against him, who determine to live and die in sin. You can get a picture of it's an awful, terrible situation, but to really understand it, that once you come to the judgment seat of Christ and he pronounces, depart from me, I never knew you into the fires prepared for the devil and his angel, you won't get out. There's no more than that in a place of anguish and pain and terror that is described by fire burning continually and torment that's greater than man can bear, but he must bear it. And it never ends. The lake of fire, which is the second death, meaning the second separation, which is eternal separation. Men don't think about that. They have all sorts of curious and novel ideas about what's going to happen to them, but they don't realize that in the light of New Testament truth for our day, men will be judged and men will be therefore sentenced. However, and this is the reason I said in the beginning, this lesson is designed to cheer up, to encourage the faithful child of God. So what I've just said is not the case with the faithful child of God. Because the faithful have lived their lives just the opposite of those who have been rebellious in their sins. They've not lived in rebellion to God. They're walking in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1, 7. They're laboring to know the truth and to bring their lives in submission to the truth. In fact, in being in the church, they're in a state of favor. We must realize that. Because you've been added to the blood-bought body, because you've been cleansed by the blood of Christ, and then as you walk in the light as he is in the light, you're continually cleansed by the blood of Christ so that your sins do not rise up to condemn you. We have not, the faithful child of God, persisted in error, but there's ever a penitent attitude, fully aware of how weak we are in the flesh and how it's so easy to violate the truth and fully aware that we can't merit our way to heaven. Some people think, well, I'm doing all these good things so they'll offset the bad things I know I did. No, that's not Christianity. But it is an attitude, a state of mind, a mindset in every child of God to walk according to the teachings of Christ. Look in uh, chapter 1 in verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Well, that's just another way of saying you can't think of yourself as faithful and acceptable to Christ and having the hope of heaven if you've got sin in your life. In this case, it's not loving your brethren. But it could be anything. You can't serve God with reservations. It's a possibility. Well, I'll give this much of my life to him, 
But now I'm going to hold this over here. No stories told about the fellow that was being baptized. Just before he was plunged under the water, he reaches back and puts his billfold up on the side of the baptistry. And the preacher said, why would you do that? He said, well, I want to use that like I want to. <laughs> that won't work. When you're truly, as the scriptures teach, baptized into Christ, that baptism preceded by belief, repentance, and confession of faith in Christ, all that you are and have goes with it, regardless of what anybody else does. It doesn't make any difference if all of you are as corrupt as they can be. It doesn't make any difference if I am, insofar as what your obligations to God are. And we should live our lives doing our best to understand that. And yet so many times members of the church say, well, look at so-and-so and look at so-and-so. The answer to that is look at yourself. Why are you letting people that aren't maybe necessarily what they ought to be stop you from being what you ought to be? How are you going to answer that at the judgment? Well, you won't. You'll just be condemned. So the love of the faithful child of God in every instance leads one to obey the commandments of God, John 14 and verse 15. Now, upon our Lord's death, or even at the time of his second coming, the faithful children of God cannot be said to fall into the hands of God or that God is a consuming fire to them. Because when our Lord comes, then those who have lived faithful have been those who have not been rebellious and disobedient. Their life has been formed around learning the truth and living according to it. And wherein they see their life is not in harmony with it, they confess it. And they pray God for forgiveness. That's faithful Christian living. So based then on the Christian's love for God and one's obedience to God's will, God's amazing and marvelous plan is brought to perfection and thus the faithful are able to come before the judgment bar of Christ in boldness with confidence and freedom and encouragement because we appear before him covered by the blood of the lamb and God sees us as having no sin these words are designed to remove the faithful child of God for the terrible fear that those outside of Christ and those disobedient to him have. I talked to a man long years ago. He's dead now. But up until he was in his 30s, he didn't live the Christian life. He freely confessed it. And I said, well, what did you do seeing that you were reared in a family that was a member of the church and you obeyed the gospel, but then you went astray and did all sorts of things that weren't right while you were? How did you keep that from haunting you and from moving your conscience to repent? How did you do that when you knew you were living contrary to what the Bible teaches you should be thinking and doing? And here's the answer, I think, to all the people who do such things, especially those who apostatize. He said, every time the thought would come to my mind that I was wrong and going to die and lose my soul, I drove it from my mind. I would not think about it. That's the way it works because we're free moral agents. Our wills can be exercised to entertain thoughts on things and encourage us to do right, or we can do as Pharaoh did, harden our hearts. And one of the ways you do it is to drive from your mind what ultimately you're going to face, and that for all eternity. To justify yourself in any way you can. And you know, Satan must be having a great time with that when he sees people doing it. It must just make him, if you can conceive of Satan laughing, just laugh with glee when he sees people turning against the obvious. Because right now it's not happening. Right now the judgment's not happening. 
how many times over the years, even beginning with our own obedience to the gospel, our possible repenting of sins after you've obeyed the gospel, have you rejoiced and felt a great load and weight lifted? Because, you know, God does not now hold those sins against you that they're remitted, they're cast aside, they're blotted out. So with great boldness, the faithful child of God will stand before the judgment bar of Christ because he'll stand there covered by the blood of the Lamb and be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. If you're not a child of God today, we've studied in this sermon in how to become one. If you're a child of God and you've sinned, we urge you then to know God's second law of pardon, to repent of sins, confess your sins, and pray God for forgiveness. We yet have time. That's the point Peter made, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why that clock back there and all your timepieces continue to tick on because God wants you to take advantage of this time to obey the gospel and prepare to meet thy God. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sit.